and we'll send that out to all the participants and, and any people that have registered, obviously, who can't join on the day. Um, we'll keep everybody muted because otherwise that would just be chaos, wouldn't it? If we had a, if we, we tried not to. Um, we have two presentations. The first is from one of my colleagues, Andy Hayes, who is going to talk about um, their new clinical homelessness service. And then we have Nicholas Watkins, who is going to talk again, a colleague who's going to talk about the link in Somerset. And all of this is to help you um, hear from us and see if it prompts anything from yourselves around how we create a holistic homeless pathway. Um, and just a tiny bit on home group. I'm sure a lot of you do know us. We're a national housing and care organisation. Our care is about a third of everything we do in home group. And uh, it's our, our big driver that meets our social purpose as a charitable organisation. So we've got about 350 supported housing services and an ever growing set of more um, NHS related services. So things we've done directly with certain trusts to, to, to alleviate pressure in lots of different ways. So I hope you, you get some good intel from the sessions. We we will record it. I said that the other bit is the me the best place for questions is in the chat, and my colleague Chloe Chloe Normanton, who sets all this up, will manage that. Um, I will try if there's time to do verbal questions, but but it's quite difficult when it's a big number. I can't, we're up to sixty four on the call at the moment. So, but do use the chat and do keep in touch with us. And at that point, I will. Yep, I will hand over to Andy to get us started. Are you sharing your slides, Andy? I am indeed. Thank you, Rachel. And uh, good morning, everyone. So um, as per introduction, my name is Andy Hayes. I'm an operations manager for Home Group. I'm based in Newcastle upon Tyne. So sorry. So I um so I look after our um our homeless services in Newcastle and also our rented portfolio. So I'm just gonna share my screen and pop some slides up and we'll take a run through those. So hopefully you can see my slides. Yeah, I've got a thumbs up from Rachel. OK, so what, what I'm going to do this morning is just run through very quickly um, what services we offer, how we're commissioned um, and then a bit of a a bit of reflections and sharing the journey that we've had on creating our Newcastle clinical homeless model. So in terms of the context, we are commissioned by Newcastle City Council um, to provide just slightly over 400 beds of accommodation and float and support services. And I did notice one of my commissioners is on the call. So hi, Ray. Um, thanks for joining us today. Um, so we hold three prime cron Three, three contracts and, and have a prime and subcontractor relationship in the city. Um, so what are those 400 beds? Home Group delivers directly 150 bed spaces and then we subcontract 250 bed spaces to our partners. Uh, we have six partners, so they are Tyne Housing, St Vincent de Paul, Haven, Paul, the Northeast Refugee Service and Shelter. And we're really proud of that partnership because it gives us an opportunity and the local authority as well to work with a, a number of housing providers in the city. Uh, so we really value that. And, and I think our, our homeless model and system is a lot stronger for that. Um, so in terms of the accommodation model that Home Group offers in Newcastle, it's a mix. Uh, between small, medium and large temporary accommodation services, which are located on their own sites. Um, and then we also have a number of single person flats that operate as spokes to the main services, which we often refer to as hubs. Um, in terms of the size, we have um, some of those sites have six, six bed spaces in them and they go right up to a large young person service that we have bang smack in the middle of Newcastle called the Townside Poirier, and that has 72 bed spaces on one site. So really both ends of the spectrum there. Um, our accommodation model is scattered all over the city and suburbs, um, and we are really proud of that. So we have a great footing across the city, and that's really important to us because we don't want to risk saturation in 
in key areas um, and contrary to popular belief, we we operate services in some of the leafy suburbs as well, which again we're we're really proud of because we often talk about the homeless context in Newcastle and homelessness is a, is a problem that that manifests itself generally in the city centre. So we, we see homeless people in the city centre, but we won't resolve that in the city centre. So it's really important that we we look out further beyond the city. Uh, centre limits to to try and resolve that accommodation offer. Um, one of the key things about our contracts, and, and I always reference this when I talk about, is that we're not time bound for how long someone can stay in our services. Um, we were previously, and we did an awful lot of work with our commissioning team to understand that and some of the challenges based on just how poorly some people are that, that time limits have with us. But with that, there, there does come a challenge and we need to ensure that we have enough capacity in the homeless system. So we have daily conversations with our commissioning teams and, and the Housing Advice Centre about how we continue to support and create the capacity to cope with the demand and, then, and fundamentally ensure that the City Council can meet its statutory duties towards homelessness. And the final point on that slide is around the mantra. So, so really the mantra around homelessness in Newcastle is fundamentally about prevention. So if we can stop homelessness, that's what we should all be working towards. But if homelessness happens, then we want to make sure that it's rare, brief and non-recurring. And this is what the City Council and our commissioning team really drive us towards. So, so all of all of my colleagues who work in homelessness in Newcastle and our subcontractors, we're all working towards stopping homelessness, but if it does happen, then how do we make sure it's rare brief? And when someone leaves our homeless system, we don't see them again. We don't want them re-entering that system. And that's fundamentally how we're driving towards eradicating street homelessness in Newcastle. So in terms of why change, so um, Rachel mentioned briefly there about um, Home Group and what we do, and our strategy is around integrating health, social care and housing. And Whenever we think about this in the context of Newcastle, we've worked for, for many years in homelessness in Newcastle. Um, but Newcastle's changed, the environment's changed, cities changed, people have changed. And um, we, we, we see that in, in very simple day to day things like access to alcohol. You know, 20 years ago, you couldn't really get alcohol out, out of ours. Now it's freely available. Drugs have changed. 20 years ago, crack cocaine wasn't a thing in Newcastle. It's absolutely prevalent. And we know that lots of our homeless people have um, challenges around substance misuse. So, so we were trying to look at that and think, well, how could we change and adapt our practice to, to fundamentally meet this desire to eradicate street homelessness? And one of the things that we did in that was we surveyed our customers back in 2018, um, because what we were suggesting was that lots of homeless people are poorly ill. Um, so we wanted to try and understand that. And again, our commissioning teams were keen for us to, to share that information with them. And back in March 2018, out of the about the 400 customers, 63% uh, were reported as having a diagnosed mental health need or condition. 12% um, of our customers were, were, were not diagnosed, but there was something there. So, so that told us about 75% of our customers had some form of mental health issue. And that was really the catalyst to try and do something different. Because when we looked at our data, we were seeing people returning to the homeless system time and time again and that was what we really wanted to try and try and tackle and resolve and then interestingly we we re-ran that research in in March 21 the same exercise and those figures have jumped up from 75 to 80 percent of our homeless customers having some form of mental health issue so there's a significant challenge there around the the health and well-being of our of our homeless community so in terms of our services in Newcastle, so um, staffing is our biggest asset. Um, we've got large commission contracts and, and we've got a large staffing team. So that's made up of myself as an operations manager that oversees it. And then I have a housing partnership manager to manage the relationship with our subcontractors. I have four senior client service managers who directly manage services with the help from their six client service managers. And then we have 33 support workers and um, we have concierge to um, support our services overnight. So our, our services are staffed 24 seven. And then we also have our handy persons and our housekeepers. And every one of those people in that staffing list is integral to what we do. 
Um, and it's really important for us that we deliver high um, high accommodation standards, but also high levels of support. And I'll talk a bit more about the support model. But I guess the biggest change for us was around employing clinical colleagues. So in our model, we employ two mental health practice leads or, or mental health nurses. We have a senior occupational therapist. Uh, we also employ two band five occupational therapists. And then we're really proud of this. Um, we we created uh, an occupational uh, apprenticeship programme in conjunction with Northumbria University. So we have two colleagues who were support workers, but we're really keen to pursue a, a career with home group in a slightly different context. So not a management context. They wanted to go and specialise in a health related field. So um, they're set to graduate in summer of 2023. Um, so that, I guess, is the fundamental change to what the what the previous operating model was. Uh, and we were commissioned and went live in 2019 under this this clinical structure in on the 1st of October in 2019. And our clinical colleagues joined us in December of 2019. Uh, we, we had to take a bit of time to recruit and uh, get those colleagues on board with us. But just before I talk about the, the clinical element, I just want to take you through the next slide, which is about our model of support. And this is really important to us in home groups. So this really is the grounding for how we work with people. And, and our model is called, we use the acronym LIFE. So it's the LIFE model, and it's around living independently and feeling enabled. And in the model, you'll see there, hopefully no surprise to anyone on the call, but uh, customer is at the absolute heart of it. And at the top, we have the three principles, and these are about how we do things. So in terms of being person centred, we know that one size doesn't fit all. It certainly doesn't work in, in a homeless context. And we also know that our customers are the experts. So within that, we also operate in a psychologically informed way and we use the skill sets around um, understanding relationships and how they're the primary tool for change. So that's how we link from person centred to psychologically informed. And then we're also strengths based and we use language, we try to change the language that we use, particularly in the Newcastle context, and we focus on what's strong, not wrong. And that's really important to us because what we tend to find is if someone's coming into one of our services, having literally been street homeless, there is a lot of things wrong in their life um, and, and not a lot of things going well. But when we get the, the person into our service, safe, secure, stabilised, we always find the strengths and then we start to, to build those and work with the customer. And then underneath there, we've got the three domains around well-being, skills and physical health. So these are the things that are both important to our customers and for our customers. Um, and in well-being, we, we spend a lot of time in the homeless system looking at quality of life and then the relationship piece and family and friends. Uh, the skill sets areas is, again, another huge piece of work for us where we look to support our customers and build them up. So, again, in a homeless context, that may, might be around managing a tenancy and conversations around paying your rent and service charge and bills and, and really practical skills that will go hopefully towards um, that customer leaving our services and being able to manage and maintain their own tenancy uh, on their own. Um, and then in terms of physical health, we also spend quite a lot of time talking about things like healthy lifestyles and actually ensuring that our customers can and do have access to health services, because we know as a group of people, homeless people are generally excluded from most services. Lots of reasons why that is, but we try and remove some of those um, those barriers and, and try and get our customers back into the health service because well, we know not least 80 percent of our customers probably have some form of uh, mental health need. And we also have very um, poor levels of physical health as well with our customer base um, and, of course, substance use as well. So treatment programs. So that's a quick canter through our, our model of support. Um, in terms of introducing clinicians, though, this is where it got really interesting for us. So in December 2019, we started to work with our clinicians. And if I'm honest, we made a few mistakes. So the first mistake was understanding that clinicians don't have a magic wand and can't fix people. Um, so that was a bit of learning for us. But um, one of the mistakes that we made was we tried to parachute our clinicians in when there was an issue in our service and it didn't work. And, and it didn't work for, for really a key reason in that we weren't building any stability in our model. Um, 
so we stopped doing that and we and we stripped it back and said well hang on a minute let's actually go and speak to our customers and speak to our staff and see what they say so uh we carried out a number of focus groups with our customers and they said generally speaking they felt stuck in a system they felt that they had a loss of identity they had a fear of change um but they also didn't want to stay the same they felt that they weren't understood they felt they weren't heard and they just generally felt unsafe so we took that information and we then went and spoke to all our colleagues and they kind of said the same thing, which was quite surprising for us. Um, so our colleagues said that they felt stuck. They felt alone and dumped on. They felt there was unclear boundaries about where the role of a support worker stopped and started. Um, they felt that the whole was not valued. And what they meant by that was that we see our customers because they live in our services 24 seven, but some other parts of the system around helping people mightn't see our customers at all because they're excluded from it or or maybe for a very short period of time and they felt that they struggled to articulate the the whole story of the of the customer um, colleagues said that they felt uncared for at times and they were very fearful of repercussions so we we looked at this and we thought well how do we strip this back and and ensure that our clinicians are there to support our colleagues to ensure that they're in the strongest place to support our customers. And we used um, psychologically informed environments as the vehicle to do that. Um, and unfortunately, we don't really have time today to go into that. I could spend an awful lot of time talking about that. But that was a fundamental change for us about moving towards bringing clinicians in and embedding models. And, and I'm going to try and explain that very quickly using the trans theoretical model of change. Um, one of the things that um, I was always very keen to do was to create a model which would fundamentally improve our colleagues working lives. Which would mean that we would be delivering better in inverted commas support and, and ensuring that once our customers left our services, we, we hopefully didn't see them again in the homeless system. But there's a challenge with introducing clinicians because some you run the risk of blurring lines between health and housing. And so we had to find a way that we could articulate this. And it was one of our mental health nurses, Andrew Garaba, said, well, OK, let's have a conversation and use the trans theoretical model of change. So I'm sure this will be familiar to lots of people on the call, but it certainly wasn't to me as a traditional housing manager. Um, and what Andrew was explaining was that lots of our customers who enter the homeless system arrive to us in the pre-contemplation stage. So we're at the, the top of the diagram there. And the work that we need to do is around stabilising them and scaffolding and trying to support them to move in into the contemplation stage. Because when you move a customer from pre-contemplation to contemplation, it means that they're aware that they've got some problems. Um, but they're not quite sure about what they need to do. And that's where the, the support plan comes into play, that the clinicians help our support colleagues to articulate and deliver with our customers. And then we slowly move from contemplation to preparation. And when you're in the preparation stage, this is where the customer is generally intent on taking action to address the problems. And this is where you can start to do things like refer to other services. So this is the key change for us because you don't know what you don't know. And prior to working with clinicians, we would have customers present in our services and we would try and stabilize them over the period of you know, a couple of days and then recognize that there's drug and alcohol issues and we would refer them into drug and alcohol services. But actually the customer was probably in pre-contemplation stage. So the chance of that, that treatment program happening or, or even attending the appointment was very, very low, but we didn't understand that. So we now do the work around stabilizing and scaffolding with our customers. And it's only when we move into preparation stage that we consider those referrals into, into health services or treatment services and things like that. And that was a significant penny drop moment for us in Newcastle and frankly prompted a call into our treatment services to apologize for what was probably a history of inappropriate referrals, but we didn't know. So we hope we've, uh, we've improved access rates and take up at the very least in that um, and then once the customer has gone from preparation they move into action and and they're hopefully accessing um, health services and treatment services and then our clinicians support our support workers with interpreting the health plan into a housing related support plan um, and then our support workers deliver the plan 
and then we move into maintenance and we have sustained change. And at that point, generally speaking, our customers exit the homeless service and that's it. However, not everyone follows that pathway and some customers relapse. So the model allows for relapse. And we see relapse even before people exit our services. So we'll have customers who are doing really well and we're working on the plans to uh, find uh, uh, accommodation elsewhere in the city for them out of the services and then we have a relapse and that's fine. We know we understand the relapse. We understand the behaviours associated with that and we start again and the model just keeps going and going and going. And if we have time at the end, I'll talk through a very quick case study about that. But this this model has been fundamental to us in terms of understanding the role that clinicians and support workers can play together, but also not blurring the lines between health and housing. So there's a very clear line in the sand here between home group clinicians working with our staff to deliver support and not replicating what happens in a, in a hospital or a treatment service. And we have to be really clear about that because it's important that we're not uh, overstepping the mark on that. So hopefully that's helpful in terms of understanding what the clinical model in essence is. And then finally, it just last slide here with a bit of bit of outcomes on it. So we have lots of data um, and that data, I, I haven't put it on here because it is endless, but um, we use that data with our commissioners to shape what the future of homeless services looks like in Newcastle. Um, and we've used the data to um, influence um, bidding for um, funding rounds that come through. So we've been successful around NSAP funding programmes, RSI5 as well. Um, and we're also currently waiting the forthcoming briefings for the SHAP funding program and you know hopefully hopefully getting a, a bid into the with the support of the city to continue to evolve our homeless services. And in terms of that evolution of services, we've been working really hard to to try and understand homeless better. So for years we've been able to get people off the streets, which is great. But it, the piece is about how you never see those people again back in the homeless system. So we're, we've done an awful lot of, around that and also challenging and really thinking about some models. So housing first as a homeless concept is really prevalent at the moment. Um, at Home Group, we talk about something slightly different. So we talk about tenancy first because I think what we do in terms of our understanding of people is reflect on that and the fact that People don't live in the same house for, for their whole lives and people move around the city and we're really keen to promote a model that allows for that. Um, and, and we do that to good effect in Newcastle, both in the homeless systems when we move people, but also when people exit the system and into our accommodation in the city. Uh, we're keen to support people to continue to move if that's what they need to do. But the fundamental basis is keep a roof over the person's head so that they don't re-enter the homeless system. And that work is then influencing conversations that we're having with city council around creating a whole housing system. So how do you enable a system that comes together and takes advantage of, of everything you've got in the city, both that home group and others offer, and then consolidate it with, again, the, the net outcome being that people are safe and secure in their homes, they're well supported if they need it. They can flex up and flex down in terms of their support but fundamentally they never become homeless again and are, and are supported at times of relapse. And that conversation is then shaping us towards perhaps more of a health led approach and being truly person centred for, for those residents in our city who need that help. And that conversation is sort of slightly more broad than the topic of today, but that incorporates our general needs accommodation, our learning disability services, mental health services, homeless services, and our older person services. So we're really trying to consolidate that model. And I've got two very quick case studies that I'll just canter through. So the first is River, and we're ever so proud of River. So River was in the homeless system, addicted to heroin for over 35 years, many, many spells of street homelessness. Um, and he was referred to us by the Housing Advice Centre, so Newcastle City Council, and we went to go and meet River. He was living in a private tenancy in an area of the city and uh, he was isolated. He was being physically and financially abused and his landlord was about to evict him. Um, so we were able to build that relationship with River, um, create the tenancy focused support plan 
But in doing that, when we started to work with River, he was really, really poorly. So we managed to convince River um, to, to go to hospital. And uh, we're very pleased that he did because River categorically would not be with us because uh, whenever River went into hospital, he was diagnosed as full of sepsis and he had his leg amputated the following day. Uh, so a really, really tragic set of events for River. Whilst he was in rehab, though, our support worker, Sharon, was able to work with our OT, Hannah, and they they got out to meet River and, and developed a positive uh, move on plan in conjunction with River. Um, our OT then carried out some functional environmental assessments and we got one of our properties from our general needs stock and adapted it to meet River's needs. Um, and then we managed to get Support River getting discharged out of rehab and into his own property. And then we did a, the, did the work around a holistic assessment of River's physical and mental health, which enabled us to tailor his support plan. So that thing I was talking about in, in the trans theoretical model of change. Um, and we're now at a stage now where River proactively manages his own health and well-being. He's uh, no longer using heroin. He's really stable on a methadone program and his um, dosage has dropped from 85 milligrams a day to around 12 milligrams a day. And, and River is very vocal in saying that he wants that gone out of his life and, and he no longer wants to, to have methadone either. And there's a little quote that I'll read to you. So River said, home group have given me a sense of worth. I now have a place in the world again and it feels sustainable. I am truly thriving. Um, and it, it gets me every time when I when I look at River's story. Um, and the second the second um, story that I just wanted to talk you through. So this is a very recent case and this is the case of Jack. And it's interesting for us because we're learning all the time through this model. So Jack was a young lad who was in our young person service, the, the scheme I referenced, Townside Foyer. Um, and Jack did really well in his support plan and ended up getting a job. So we were able to move Jack out of the service and again into one of our units. And Jack went off and lived his life and he did really well um, for about 12 months. And then it's probably about 14, 16 weeks ago, Jack presented back into the service and he was in a full relapse. So he was on sick leave from work. He um, was using again. He was gambling again. He was drinking again. So all those sorts of things were still, were very much going wrong in Jack's life. Um, and he came in in crisis into the service and asked for help. So we were able to scaffold around Jack again. Um, and our commissioners were absolutely brilliant because we used some spot purchase money that they had secured through a funding bid, an RSI 5 bid, and we got some additional support put in to try and get Jack stabilised and built back up again. And we've done that and Jack's been able to sustain his tenancy. There was absolutely no doubt Jack's tenancy would have been cuckooed and he would have fled it because of um, the people that were starting to associate with him. Um, but that hasn't happened. Jack's maintained his tenancy. And interestingly, and this is the learning piece for this, when Jack was in the midst of his relapse, he would have been entitled to claim personal independence payment, and that would have given Jack an extra £90 a week. But he didn't want to because Jack knew where that £90 would go and he didn't, he didn't want to be part of that. So this is something that we're, we're starting to work on to understand because that's quite a significant saving in, in terms of um, universal credit. And we've had this conversation with our welfare rights colleagues in Newcastle because he was entitled to that. So there's an ethical issue around Jack should have been entitled to that, but Jack didn't want it. And uh, Jack's now back at work and we're, we're delighted for him. So Two, two contrasting uh, case studies there, but this model, I've always said this model is about learning and, and Jack's presented a new set of challenges that we're, we're trying to take to the next level with um, with our commissioning team in the council. Um, so I shall stop sharing my screen now. And um, hand back over. Andy, I'm sure I speak on behalf of others as well. That was brilliant. Really, really insightful. There are lots of questions. So, um, and we need your expertise to answer them. Uh, I shall have a look. So, I, I, and Chloe, Chloe's there too, yeah. to help with I, that. Um, there's a couple I was going to answer, but then I thought, mm, you're really the expert. 
so see, see how you get on. But equally, Chloe said that we will pull all the questions. We'll do it today into one form with the answers and send to everybody um because because there's some great stuff in there so thank you very much on behalf of everyone um and then i think we'll move if that's all right straight to uh nicholas nicholas watkins who runs the link in somerset i'm hoping you're there you are <laughs> there he is you're on mute yeah, I'm here, Rachel. Thank you very much. So, yeah, Nicholas Watkins, I manage the, the link uh, community wellbeing support service based in South Somerset and I'll, um, I'll share, share my screen with you as well. OK, so hopefully you can see my screen all OK. Yeah, that's all good. OK, so. Um, I'll talk initially a little bit about the um, the development of the link um, and the concept of the link came from um, a Positive Lives initiative um, back in 2016 in Somerset. Um, so there was a, a pot of money that was left over within the Somerset County Council um, after um, they stopped the contracts for um, the pathways of accommodation for adults across the county and the responsibility of that went more so with the um, with the district authority. And within um, Somerset itself, we currently have five, although it will become a Unitarian authority next next year. Um, so Home Group kind of looked at um, what we could kind of do to improve the offer of support to um, those people who are homeless or experience homelessness within South Somerset. And we kind of focused on key areas of delivery that we felt um, and in consultation with our with our customers at the time, which would kind of help them in their um, terms of moving forward and not those repeating patterns of entering back into homelessness provision again. Um, we reviewed the health and wellbeing strategy for Somerset at the time. Um, we spoke to our customers about what they what they wanted going forward and very much around that kind of tenancy support, not only kind of for, for where they were in accommodation, in particular support accommodation settings, um, but also when they go into general needs, needs accommodation and how they can maintain contact with services without it breaking down and returning back to, to stage one. Um, we gave a strong focus on social prescribing um, and for our, for our customer group, it was, it was a lot about empowerment, about what, what they wanted in terms of taking control for, for themselves. Um, and then the, the key aim around that was the, the prevention of homelessness and whether that's from people that we're working with um, that were street homeless, um, but also people who were in um, general needs accommodation, whether that was um, privately rented accommodation or whether it was registered social landlord accommodation um, and trying to work with those individuals as well in order to prevent, um, you know, people presenting back back to the district council in particular to say that they were, you know, facing eviction. Um, the staffing structure of the of the link, which has developed over the um, the last couple of years, really. So our initial part when we um, when we started, we had three members of staff which were added to a large accommodation service. Um, and it, what we started to try and do was to show the benefit of what, what we were able to offer, and it became a standalone service as a, as a community-led led approach. Um, so we have a, a, um, a lead outreach coordinator. Uh, we have a, um, an outreach health coordinator. Um, we have a health coach that works within our accommodation services within South Somerset. Um, we provide um, a support coordinator to, to our accommodation service and then we also have um, a support coordinator that works across our intensive housing management services within um, South Somerset to which there are um, 35 units um, that, that that member of staff works with. Um, a key focus of, of the link um, and what we've developed over the last um, um, three years in particular has been around our tenancy sustainment model. Um, and Home Group provide um, this through the Home Achievement Programme, which we abbreviate down to, to the HAP. Um, and with, that, with HAP, we provide that in, with three members of staff now coming out, out of that service. And I'll talk a little bit more about HAP later on. Um, and then we also um, have a hospital resettlement coordinator. And again, I'll talk about that role a little bit, a little bit later on. And a couple of concierge workers um, that are essential to, to our schemes as well that um, work across all our accommodation services within Yeovil in South Somerset on a on a nightly basis. So not just based in one place, but it can be responsive in in different units of accommodation. And that way, we've kind of 
manage the cost element of what concierge offer as well. Um, so our first point of call is our assertive outreach team. Um, we work with anybody new that's presenting as a rough sleeper within, within South Somerset. Um, and we also um, work with local landlords and local other um, partners who have accommodation services um, to work with customers who are facing eviction. So anybody that's um, given notice, we look to meet with prior to them um, being evicted and we might look at some preventative work at that stage. Um, but we will also look to build that relationship in case somebody does end up as being um, street homeless at that point. Um, we chair the weekly complex case review meeting within South Somerset. Um, so any kind of complex case that um, is either within a hospital setting within and whether that be in a, in a mental health ward um, that are brought forward to that meeting where we have um, nurse practitioners, we have the local authority, other housing providers, um, and mental health um, um, teams um, present within in the meeting to look at what sort of wraparound support offer we can offer for the, those individuals. Um, the numbers that I put into this are kind of like year, year to date figures in the financial year to date. So we've supported 92 customers in the in the financial year so far um, within South Somerset who have presented within within the link. Um, and we've put a little quote down there just so you know others kind of aware about the impact that's had on people that have accessed the um, the service. Um, the weekly case meeting. Um, links into the into the accommodation pathway within within South Somerset. So we're not saying everybody has to go to, you know, stage one accommodation um, first in order to, to to do several months there in order to move elsewhere. What we look at is that individual and see where they they fit. Um, so that that would be looking at other accommodation providers to see whether they've got any voids. Um, seeing what support is going to go with them and when they go to that different accommodation. So all of those bits are about putting that person at the centre and kind of going back to what Andy was talking about and, you know, the life model that we that we, you know, look to put into place for all the customers that we that we work with. Um, some partnership feedback there for people to look at and a kind of a, a couple of different um, parts of that. Firstly, um, from South Somerset Housing Options team. Um, kind of demonstrates how we um, really focus on the individual to whether that's looking at um, the preventative work, but all those kind of positive interventions that we're able to put in put into place. Um, and with other partners that we work with, including the police, um, you know, unfortunately within South Somerset, as it is with, with a lot of other areas, there's quite a high prevalence around county lines. Um, and one of the case studies that were attached to the slides to go out is it draws a reference to that of somebody that we've worked with. Um, but that's about looking at being, you know, putting resources in place with with immediate effect, really, in order to support people who are really vulnerable in our in our communities, in order to get them to a place of safety. Um, so going back to how we kind of develop the link, a big focus on on health and wellbeing, and then, like I said, going back to the the, um, the health and wellbeing strategy for Somerset at the time, and looking about how we could focus stuff for our our. Um, our customers and people that we're working with. So health coaching was was relatively new to home group at, at that point, um, to which we now have several health coach roles within within the link. One of them um, primarily working on an outreach basis. So really looking to do um, health and wellbeing assessments with individuals to get them um, accessing um, appropriate um, medical services. So for people that I say haven't been um, registered with a GP for a long period of time, um, people that are presenting at A&E with with frequency um, and, you know, part of linking in with the with the local hospital was to try and find out whether we had people that were returning, you know, a lot for, say, wound care, et cetera, through infected needle sites um, to which we then um, can look to put in the brief interventions to to support them. So within South Somerset now we have a nurse nurse practitioner team, outreach team, uh, which is public health funded. Um, and we are outreach team linking with the, the nurse practitioners in order to provide that immediate medical care to people if required. But again, it's a way of getting people into medical services um, in an appropriate manner rather than just presenting at A&E. &E. Um, we also link in with a local dentist um, where we run um, a campaign. There's one happening this Saturday, actually, um, where the local dentist will offer appointments to homeless people. And it's been a key area of um, as in all, all health for um, for the homeless community for a long time or people that have been on 
metadone scripts for a long period of time and the confidence it comes from being able to, to smile. Um, so it's a really important um, aspect of the work that we do. Um, we promote the uh, the five ways to, to well-being, connecting with people, being active. So we run um, a, um, a health and well-being walk on a monthly basis. We do our monthly awareness campaigns, and that could be um, from looking at um, you know, things like mental health or diabetes uh, aware, awareness, um, suicide prevention. Um, so every month we're looking to put on something that just ra raises awareness, not only within the health and wellbeing hub, um, but also within our accommodation services. And we anything that we kind of promote within the link itself goes out to all partnership agencies for anybody to be able to drop in and, and attend. Um, a really good addition to to the link is that the um, South Somerset District Council also fund a, fund a counsellor. Um, so anybody that's accessing our service and if um, they're in that right stage and a bit like what Andy spoke about, that kind of pre-contemplation stage or contemplation stage of recovery, um, that we refer people in. So instead of having to go through a process of being linked in with a GP or through mental health services or within drug and alcohol services, we're able to offer um, counselling sessions to, to individuals that, that would like, like that to um, to see whether it benefits in, in any way. So for and again this year we've had 38 referrals go in with 164 appointments attended. And, it, and it's quite interesting on those stats, which I can point to as well, the, the like the do not attend ratio to that is, is relatively low. So it kind of shows the benefit of, of what we're looking to do. And I think that South Somerset are looking to kind of upscale that offer of, of what's happening within counselling, but it's essential to to our um customers to be able to access it. Um, so tenancy sustainment um, and a bit like what Andy was saying, you know, we acknowledge that people will move into different units of accommodation at different times in, in their life. But what underpins that is the ability to be able to manage it. And for a lot of our customers that we've worked with, who have had difficulties at different times. What we've tried to, to then do is to um, equip them with the skills to be able to, to manage that and to be um, so resilient in, in their own way. Um, so the modules that, that we do within our tenancy accreditation scheme are probably lots of you have heard about tenancy accreditation schemes in the past. Um, we have um, 48 different modules um, that we offer now within within HAP. We bracket it into four different areas of health and well-being, employability, promoting independence and social responsibility. Um, it's an accredited course that goes through the one awards. Um, so whereas um, it provides certification for individuals that, that complete it, which is fantastic as well. Um, so we have three um, members of staff that do that deliver this across South Somerset at the moment. I've just put up the modules for you to kind of look at whilst I'm um, talking and how, how we deliver that at the moment. Um, so we deliver um, HAP in conjunction with Somerset District Council as part of the accommodation pathway. So people who would be in any supported accommodation service, whether it's high support as in a hostel accommodation, low to medium or how intensive housing management schemes, that there's the um, the expectation of, of engagement with, within the tenancy accreditation scheme. In order to complete it, you have to have nine credits and you can see against each of the um, modules that we offer are different scores. Um, and those they need to add up to nine in order for, for full completion. What we often look at, say, promoting in, independence is around that first one, acquiring and managing a tenancy, crucial to a lot of people that have um, experienced difficulties in the past of managing their, their own accommodation. Um, we would look at budgeting skills for people that have experienced debt anywhere. Um, but also it's about being able to give people confidence and there's um, you know, big parts about you know skills promoting and emotional resilience for um you know understanding um self-esteem which going back to our kind of um, more trauma-informed approach now we know that if we're trying to support people to move on that you know they also need to have the the skills to understand themselves and their own emotions and how they they impact on themselves um so within um our hap delivery like i said we've got three roles we've got a member of staff that delivers hap to people with supported accommodation service. Um, we have a member of staff that delivers this as a um, as a course to people who are in all temporary units of accommodation within South Somerset. Um, and since 2019, which was tricky as the initial part of that because of COVID, um, but we also deliver 
um, HAP to um, people who live in registered social land or accommodation. And we also offer it to, to people in private rented. So the the part around the um, the registered social landlord accommodation was driven by um, the home, Somerset Home Finder, which is um, which holds all the um, registered social landlord stock within the within Somerset. And uh, more of those adverts now will now have um, a tenancy accreditation box on them. So future landlords will know whether people have completed this that have gone through that kind of process of change. Um, and then we also offer it on that preventative measure. So if people were in registered social landlord accommodation or um, private rented that are getting into difficulty, that we look to do some positive intervention at that point. So HAP is not just a tenancy accreditation scheme. It's also the other support that goes with it. And what we find when we first start working with people in particular in their own accommodation, that we have to unpick all those other support needs that are prevalent to start with. That might mean that we get the health coaches involved, might mean they get referred into the counsellor. Um, and then we start to be able to do HAP when it's when it's meaningful to do so. Um, there's a bit of a quote there but, uh, around what we what we have. So, you know, I felt quite emotional during the module. Um, it's been a touchy subject for me, but I'm doing the module. It's helped me gain more confidence in myself to deal with my mental health, which is, you know, underpins so much for the people that we that we work with. Um, landlord feedback. So Hatton Woods is a landlord within South Somerset. Um, I think the part that bottom part to that, they've consistently shown us sympathetic yet proactive approach ensuring a positive outcome for both us as a landlord and, and our tenants alike so what what we know around the cost around evictions for landlords is massive and what we're able to 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 do is to work with both the landlord and the, and the tenant in order to try and avoid that happening um so currently we're working with 33 customers um to complete hat within sorry 66 customers to complete hat within um south somerset um, our next um, role that we have, um, which is again vital to our local area, is um, hosp hospital reassessment. So we have a member of staff that um, links in with the with Yoga District Hospital and also with the mental health um, services, not only within um, within Yeovil but also within in Somerset because people are sometimes placed in in out of their own area. Um, so we. Um, have a presence at the at the local hospital um, as in we can do that remotely but we we go in and make certain that people know, know who we are which is fantastic what we look to do at that point is anybody that's um, um, presented at the hospital who is of no fixed abode um, or is stating that there are no fixed abode, abode that we would start to work with them the key part to that is around completing the duty to refer um, so we complete that that's often responsibilities of um, of uh, the hospital, we kind of take take that um, take that form in order to make certain that that we get it completed quickly. Um, those once the duty to refer is completed, it gets um, sent to the to the local authority. At that point, they will determine whether they have a duty to to accommodate. And if they do so, then we're liaising closely with the housing options team to see what the outcome is going to be. If there's no duty, then um, our hospital resettlement worker then shows more responsibility in trying to source the suitable accommodation or for that person to return to their own accommodation, say linking in with um, um, the occupational therapist to see whether there's any adaptations that need to be be done, linking in with adult social care, seeing whether maybe there needs to be a care package that needs to be agreed in order to support people back into their accommodation. Um, we've worked with 31 customers this year so far, all have been supported back, so we haven't had any repeated um, parts of people presenting again and then um, coming out NFA. Um, so that's been been really positive um, and it's just turned into into a crucial role and part of like kind of like the Homeless Re Reduction Act is what kind of really gave the emphasis for for that role to be developed. Um, so going back to to the link and the um, I suppose the, the big part of the link was around a, com a community hub. So again, kind of, you know, going back to parts of what Andy spoke to, that what we're trying to to do is to offer um, a space for people to engage with staff or other people that have gone through change in a positive way that if things get difficult again, they can re-engage. So instead of things getting, you know, to that stage where they don't want to talk to anybody about anything, that we're really trying to focus on kind of like that multi-agency approach for, for people. And the, the bits that you can kind of see on those lists are all things that have um, been put forward by people that we work with. So the peer forums, the volunteering opportunities, 
um, training, anything that provides that new skill. And again, going back to like those five ways of well-being really is about, you know, say learning new, new skills and employability and, you know, self-worth. So we kind of look at the different groups that we're, that we're able to, to offer that provide that as an incentive really for, for people to be engaged with. Uh, we opened um, an accommodation service for the link in December 2020, um, an eight bed service based in Yeovil, uh, low to medium support. Um, again, going back to um, how Andy discussed our life model, of what we offer, that's that's the same support package that we offer to all our customers in that service. Um, we do have kind of a focus on a shorter term stay, so we're looking really um, at six to nine months, although that's not not kind of contractually written in. Um, but what we acknowledge is that services in particular accommodation services, if they stay static, then it's really difficult to then be able to start supporting people um, with the, I suppose, the, the focus that they'll be able to, to get accommodation at some point. So the good part about the, the eight units of accommodation they have that they feed into other housing management services in the area. So we're hopeful that people are able to, to move on. Um, and kind of down the bottom of that, you can see that we've had 24 customers since since um, since we've kind of started. 17 have moved on, so we've had like a, a 94% positive move on rate from that service, which is which is fantastic. Um, and only only one person um, left through through an abandonment um, because they returned to a pre previous partner. Um, a big big focus at the two two areas really on our accommodation service. One is the engagement with the link team. So we then go back to the stuff around what we offer with our health coaches. Um, we look at being able to do the, the tenancy accreditation scheme HAP. Um, so therefore that's equipping them not to just rely on one worker when they move to other accommodation. Um, and the other the other part for the, um, for the accommodation service that we have, and again, working with South Somerset District Council is a rent to work scheme. Um, so working for our customers, one of the benefits of work are obviously fantastic, but there's also been a been a strong barrier in place for people in support and accommodation for a number of years um, to be able to get employment um, because of the the impact that has on the housing benefits allowance. So housing benefit within our um, schemes is relatively high on our on our rent rent. So anybody that's working, they would find that it's quite a negative impact financially. Um, so what the Somerset District Council do is they will underpin the um, the housing benefit, so the customer will still just pay the top up. They'll be able to save the other amount of money. It goes on for a three month period as a, as a maximum period of time, where people are looking to be gold banded through our registered social landlord scheme, or looking to go into private rented with the money that they've been able to save. So it's no longer being employed within our services it is a barrier, which which is fantastic and. I think we've been really fortunate that South Somerset District Council really listened to that as, as a part that's been really important to, to our customers. Um, a bit of a quote from our um, one of the, the customers from 188 there, um, just saying how staff have like, supported them and how, um, you know, also linking in with those uh, other agencies. So in this case, the CAB to help them get a grant for when they move on, that they have other, other um, um, items to go into their accommodation. Um, a little bit about contract info. Um, so we have a service level agreement on our services. The link itself is up until um, uh, March 2025, um, which is fantastic on our accommodation service. It's up until uh, March 24. Um, we have monitoring requirements go along with it on our accommodation. We do it on a monthly basis to really keep that live with the district um, authority to show what movement has been made. Um, and with the link itself, we provide that on a, on a quarterly. And that covers our health link, which was initially funded by the um, Rust Sleeper Initiative Fund. Um, so we'd, we're looking to make certain we can show how many people have been involved in brief interventions, how many people have been linking in with our nurse practitioners, um, and how many people that we're engaging with primary health care services in, in an appropriate manner. Um, like I said, a couple of... I'm just going to interrupt, just we are got five minutes left. OK, that's good. I was about to say that I will attach the case studies to the um, to the presentation, oh, um, but that's all, all for now. All right. I didn't mean to cut you off. I should have waited, shouldn't I, a minute? Ah, no, you're, <laughs> you're absolutely fine. It was good. Good timing. OK, thank you very thank much. Thank you so much. Thank you again. Another brilliant presentation. I, I love this sharing of what we do. Uh, even those that of us that work here learn as well. Um, and you reminded me how utterly brilliant HAP is. 
which we've done for a very long time, HAP in home group. It is a really, really good thing. I think the, the one bit I'd add to that is just how much, well, I've witnessed it anyway, how much customers, the pride customers have in achieving those different modules in HAP. Sometimes for customers who've never had, had that, never really achieved. So it's, it's a brilliant thing. Thank you. Um, there are tons of questions and Andy's been typing away like mad, answering lots of them. So we will pull that together um, and send all of that out, including uh, I'm, sh I'm sure Nicholas as well will have a look too and see what we need to respond to. Um, and I think that's it. I daren't ask for questions or we'll be here for another hour. So uh, thank you. You'll get the recording. You'll get the questions and answers. And the main thing is keep in touch with us. And if any of our services you think, is there a way in which we could shape that for you, either in either uh, NHS or, or adult social care, then keep in touch with us. That's what we want. Thank you. Have I missed anything, Chloe? No, nothing at all. We'll um, send some follow up information. And if there are any other questions that people do have, send them over to me and I'll liaise with Nick and Andy to get them answered for you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thanks all. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Thank bye. you. Cheers. Bye. bye. I'm going to wait till. Chloe, I need to go and answer the door and then I'll be back to just finish off with you. All yeah, right. OK, no problem. <laughs> Thank you.